Hello and welcome to another week of the Korean Beauty Show podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, K-beauty expert, founder of Style Story, where you can shop, learn and explore the world of Korean skincare at www.stylestory.com.au and of course your guide to what is going on here on the ground in Korea. And this month is actually a pretty big month beauty wise, I guess, in terms of K-beauty, also things like fashion and whatnot. And that is because October is Seoul Beauty Month. And what the government has done is to combine a couple of different themes and host a whole lot of events around the city that fall within the general category of beauty. So that also incorporates Seoul Fashion Week, the Seoul Music Festival. They were running a whole host of stuff at Dongdaemun Design Plaza at the beginning of the month uh, so lots and lots of different events going on with a whole range of like performers and things like that uh, cosmetics music all of these things uh, so if you are in Seoul in October uh, keep a lookout for some of the events there are plenty of different things going on and of course this month is also K-Beauty Expo month so there are a lot of different expos that are run throughout Korea, not just in Seoul, uh, with the purpose of allowing the companies here, local manufacturers, local brands to introduce their products and showcase their ranges to potential buyers. And in the past, the majority of the buyers were from overseas. So the government used to sponsor a lot of people to fly in from all over the world from the states um, we star story was sponsored several times uh, from australia and they put you up in a hotel and pay for your flights and things like that lots of buyers from europe obviously throughout the pandemic that was a pretty big no-go so even though they were still hosting some of the expos not all of the ones they used to do i went to a couple and it was just like a dead zone it was it was a little bit sad actually just because there was just not that many people visiting uh, and i felt really bad for the brands and exhibitors that had it is so hard to like put a booth together you spend so much time doing everything up and then it was just crickets like honestly there was no one at some of them. So it felt really, really bad for them. The expos are all back in full swing this year. And the biggest one on the calendar is the K-Beauty Expo that is hold, held at Kintex, which is actually about four... <laughs> It depends how, how long it takes you to get there in traffic, but maybe 40 minutes to an hour outside of Seoul in a place called Goyang. Uh, and Kintex is one of the main exhibition halls in, in Korea, I guess you could say. Uh, and they've got, you know, hotels and things like that not far away from there. So Expo uh, was from the 6th to the 8th of October uh, and I think they're expecting that a lot more people would be coming back compared to previous years but I'm not sure that it will be back to pre-COVID levels. I spoke to a lot of people that I know you know in different countries in the states and whatnot and they weren't planning to go so I think it may still be a couple of years before we get back to what it used to be. I think the other big thing that will be impacting on attendance at these expos is that foreign buyers, international buyers are maybe not so interested in coming to the expo to discover newer brands these days, just because of how many, you know, K-beauty products there are in the market. I, I know uh, in recent times, I've seen many more manufacturers uh, exhibiting, and I think maybe that's because more people are looking to make their products here these days, as opposed to discover, you know, some unknown brand that no one has heard of. So uh, that is going on at the moment. So a lot of events related to K-beauty in the month of October. Uh, so I guess, you know, keep that in mind 
mind for future years. If it's something that you're interested in, if you want to come and see what is going on. My one of the reasons I love going to the expos uh, or have loved going in past years. Now I think, you know, that I've been going for so many years. It's not as exciting as it used to be. Uh, But I think one of the things that I do appreciate the opportunity that the expo gives is that you can kind of see what trends are coming through. You know, if it's just one uh, ingredient that one brand is doing, that's definitely not enough to call it a trend. But if as you're walking around, you see more and more that the same kind of, I don't know, messaging marketing is popping up from a lot of different brands, that's usually the best indication that that's a new trend. And you can see that even in things like packaging. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago walking around, it was like, wow, minimalist packaging is clearly in. Everyone is really pairing it back and they're going for a very much sleeker looking stuff than they used to be making. Uh, So they're all the kind of things that you can see when you go. Uh, A lot of the expos also have panel discussions and things like that. I've done that in the past and sort of talked about, um, I think I did one one year on Australian cosmetic regulation, but there are usually people talking about market entry strategies for lots of different countries, people talking through, you know, the trends where they're from. There's usually a couple of representatives from the big offline retail stores or channels uh, around the world, some in Europe, whatnot, talking about what they're looking for and what their buyers are looking for. So it's just a good opportunity for lots of people from different uh, fields that are working in the beauty industry to sort of come together. There's people selling things like raw materials as well, uh, you know, if that is, I guess, an area of interest. So a lot of the news at the moment, as you would expect uh, in the in the industry, is about this and who's exhibiting and what's going on and the dates and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, the other news that I thought some of our listeners may find interesting is that the brand Misha is performing really well in Southeast Asia. So Able CNC is the parent company of Misha and also of a and they have announced that their sales have increased a lot uh, since entering Southeast Asia. In particular, they've got some product lines that are performing very well. Time Revolution is one of those lines in the Sing- in Singapore, the Philippines, and Malaysia. Apparently, their sales have grown 140% in the second half of the year, which is very impressive. Uh, and I think they are seeing Southeast Asia as a potential new opportunity Uh, you know, to expand outside of the traditional markets like Japan and China. Uh, And, you know, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Southeast Asia has a really large population and especially a lot of young people in their population as well. Uh, So they've obviously got a bit more money to spend maybe than some, you know, other people that have, I guess, more responsibilities. You know, people that are under 30 generally don't tend to have mortgages. They don't tend to have a whole lot of kids that they need to budget for. So that makes sense, I guess, that they're trying to focus on that. The e-commerce part of their business is doing really well, and they are attributing some of that to the popularity of Hallyu content. So K-pop, K-drama, uh, things like that. Obviously, K-beauty is related. If you are exposed to Korean dramas or K-pop or whatnot, it, it you know, goes without saying that you're, you are, then become curious, well, what are these people using? What products are they using to create that makeup look or get their skin looking like that? Obviously, there's also a whole lot of PPL in K-dramas. Uh, if you are a K-drama fan, you'll know that it's becoming a little bit of a joke at this point that, you know, the PPL, the product placement is so extreme. It, it's like interfering almost with the storyline sometimes that people are just like whipping out like really random products that you just would not f- expect to be in a scene just so that they can get their product placement in. So that's a little bit funny, but it is also a really good way for brands to, you know, introduce their products to different markets as well. Uh, And a lot of uh, the brands that are doing really well at the moment have a history of doing really good product placement or maybe not 
good product placement, but a lot of product placement. So it's definitely a strategy. It's not the cheapest strategy. I think it would cost quite a bit, uh, but there are a lot of brands that really enjoy doing that uh, as one of their core marketing strategies. So there you go. Misha is doing really well in Southeast Asia. Uh, so that, yeah, that, that was sort of rounding out our news headlines for the week. Now, I had a really interesting question of the week come across my desk, and I at first was like, hmm, this is a good question. I know the answer, but I need to just test it for myself to, be, to, to just see what this would, would uh, what would happen if you do it like this. So the question was this. It was a question about powder cleansers. And the question was, should I fully mix the powder first before I use the cleanser? Uh, and the second one was, can I mix it with something other than water, like maybe a rose oil or something like that? And immediately I was like, oh no, you definitely can't do that. But then I was like, let me let me just humor myself and see what would happen. So I actually went and did that and just saw. And as I suspect, it doesn't work at all. So what happens is they are activated. Powder cleansers are activated with water. And oils and waters function very, very differently, which is why when you are uh, formulating a cosmetic product, if you are combining oil and water in the same formula, you will need an emulsifier to make them blend together because obviously they are opposites. Uh, so your powder won't dissolve properly if you mix it in anything other than water. And what that means when I tried it myself is that you actually won't even be able to spread it on your face very well. Uh, it'll still have sort of chunky granular bits in the formula. And depending on how gritty the powder cleanser is to begin with, that will be more of a problem. So if you are using something like the Tosa Wong Enzyme Powder Wash, which actually has quite big chunks in it, then that is probably going to be far more like a scrub. Even using something like Subi powder cleanser that has really, really, really fine uh, a powder in it, it still won't mix in properly. Uh, and the other thing is, if you were trying to use it as a cleanser, what you will find is probably that there's going to be leftover oil at the end of that experience, uh, because it's not using uh, a beauty oil is not the same as using an oil cleanser. Uh, uh, so if you were mixing your powder wash into an oil base instead of a water base, you're not going to get a clean face at the end of it, which is not really the idea. So no, I don't think that's a good idea. In terms of whether you should fully mix the powder first before you use it, uh, I always do. And that's because I have very, very sensitive skin. So I'm not trying to use the powder as an exfoliator, but you can use it like that. I wouldn't recommend doing like, like that for every single wash, uh, particularly if you do tend towards, you know, the dry uh, sensitive, more finicky side. I would just keep it to a couple of times a week at, in, in place of an exfoliant. Uh, but in general, I think the best way to apply them is to fully dissolve the powder, mix it in properly with the water, lightly dampen your face, and then apply the you know the foam foaminess after you've already mixed it together directly to a damp face and wash like you would with any other cleanser. That's how I recommend using them. That's how I use them myself. Uh, but that was a really great question. So thank you for that. I really appreciated that one. <laughs> it had me running to my bathroom cabinet because I was like, I just need to try this for myself and see what, what would happen because I've never done it before. Uh, but there you go. That's my answer. Feel free to sanity check that uh, and see if you get a different result. But no, I don't think it's going to work very well at all. Uh, and a waste of probably a very, very good oil. So I would just keep them separate. Use your powder cleanser as a cleanser and then go in with your rose oil afterwards. It's going to be far better bang for your buck so that you don't waste it. Now, normally at this part of our episode, I run you through some of the new products that are being released on our site on Style Story. But instead, this week, I wanted to run you through some products that have just been restocked. Uh, and that is because these are two very, very popular products. People have been asking when they're going to come back. So we've had a couple of new product. Uh, well, no, we've had a couple of old products come through with new stocks. So two of them that people have been waiting on, I know, are the Tosawung Propolis Sparkle Ample and then also their Spot Whitening Vita Clinic Cream. So the 
Propolis Sparkle Ample, you know, the hint is in the name. It's a Propolis Ample. It's a really giant size. I think it's 100 mils. This has been one of our best-selling products for so many years. It was one of the very first Propolis serums, I guess, that really took the market by storm. It's just a beautiful product. Tosuong, I think, is a very underrated brand these days. I know it used to get a lot of love maybe back around 2014-15 when K-Beauty just started... Uh, being talked about in Western countries uh, and it was very, very popular. But I feel like there's so many brands doing a lot more marketing overseas these days and those are the brands that I generally tend to see people talking about. Someone on Instagram the other day actually posted uh, they, they'd done a poll of the 10 most popular K-beauty products. And honestly, I, I, I had to laugh when I saw the results because it was literally just like, when it was it was like you could have written this list in like 2015 2016 like the products that people were saying were their favorite were very very old products uh and not reflective at all of the kind of products that uh, certainly I'm seeing people buy uh, and the products that are sort of trending on our site. Uh, So there's a very big disconnect, I think, between what is being talked about online uh, and what people actually use and buy. So um, yeah, that that was, it was, it was really crazy. It was like Cosrx Snail Mucin Essence, which fair enough, that's still a popular product. People still use it. Um, and then it was, oh, that God awful mask that I cannot stand that honey one. (laughs) I've spoken about that before. That's just a personal preference. Um, but that one was one of the ones, but there was just a whole lot of really, really old products that I was just like, wow. Okay. Um, so I think there is quite a big disconnect. Anyway, this is a total tangent. I'm not quite sure how we've got here. Oh, we were talking about Tosa Wong. So Toast Wong, yeah, it was one of these brands that got a lot of uh, buzz back in the day. And I think what has happened is brands that are doing really well domestically in Korea are focusing on the Korean market and brands that are either never took off in Korea or saw other opportunities overseas and are doing much more of their marketing overseas. They're the ones that obviously it makes sense. Like where you're putting your marketing spend, you would expect to then see the results there. So the brands that are doing a lot more of their marketing in English, targeting people outside Korea, they're the ones that tend to pop up a lot on the review apps, on social media, all of those kind of things. So that is what I'm seeing at the moment. And it's at the point where uh, you will see a lot of people that are coming to Korea to, you know, go on a holiday and they're like, I can't find X, Y, or Z product at any store in Seoul. Like, where can I buy this? And 10 times out of 10, the answer is it's not sold in an offline store in Korea because the brand is, you know, one of the ones that is doing well online overseas or maybe even offline overseas, but not really sold in Korea. Uh, Nearly all of the ones that I've seen people asking about lately, it's just like, yeah, they don't have an offline store here and they're not stocked at one of the, you know, the big retail chains here. So you won't find it walking around downtown in Seoul. Like you're just not, You can walk into every beauty store in the city and you won't find that product anywhere, Uh, particularly with a lot of the sunscreens. Uh, Someone was asking me the other day if I tried, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of um, sunscreens that are really trending at the moment. Someone was like, oh, have you tried this one? You know, do you recommend it for this skin type? I haven't tried it because... I haven't seen it anywhere. Uh, so no, <laughs> there's a, there is that bit of a disconnect. So anyway, that was such a long tangent. Sorry, guys, if you've <laughs> borne with me up until now. Uh, we have had a restock of a whole bunch of products. So go and check it if you were waiting for one. Uh, off the top of my head, Laneige's Seeker Sleeping Mask is also back in stock. There was something else. What was it? Nope, it's gone. Sorry. Go and, it, go and check it out if you have been waiting on something. We did just have a shipment come through, which is why. Uh, 
So yeah, okay, on to some of the new product reviews that have been left on the site. And interestingly, we actually did just have a new five-star review for one of the restocked products, which was the Toswung Spot Whitening Vita Clinic Cream. And our reviewer said, I first tried this the day I got hit with COVID. By the afternoon, I felt like death and expected to look the same. To my surprise, my skin was still glowing and I put it down to this. Over time, I'm slowly seeing improvements with my skin texture. I like the texture of the product. And while I usually don't like any fragrance in products, I don't mind this. I use this between my moisturizer and sunscreen each morning. So thank you very much to our reviewer for leaving her review for that product. Uh, the next two reviews were from our Testers Club members. And the first one was for Nine Lesses Daily Intense Hair Essence. And our reviewer said, I was very pleased by this essence. The consistency is more like a serum uh, and is used on dry hair. A little goes a long way, but it, it didn't weigh my hair down, but left it soft and shiny. Very impressed with how smooth my hair was after use, as opposed to how it usually is dry and frizzy. Great value product, highly recommend. So thank you very much for that. Uh, always good to know how you guys are using these products as well um, because especially with hair products I feel like sometimes you get really re different results using them on dry hair versus damp hair versus wet hair so I'm always uh, I'm always interested to hear how other people are using hair products in particular because I have a lot of hair but it's very very fine and it can get weighed down very quickly I find so I tend to avoid things like um hairspray for that reason just because it just uh, doesn't tend to work very well on my hair. Uh, so the other review we had was from another Testers Club member who was testing out 23 years old's Aqua Bab modeling mask. Uh, and she said that it left her skin plump and moisturized. She tested it in the morning to see how it would affect her skin during the day. The next day she could see and feel the difference and it was a major difference. All throughout the day, her skin felt plumpy, moisturized and protected. And she said, my beloved even commented on how my skin looked different than before and she has combination oily sensitive skin with a slight texture so thank you very much for sharing your review it was a very very detailed review so I'm not gonna read the whole thing but you can go and check that uh, so that is thank you so much for leaving your review now I had uh, an email come through from one of our listeners that I would love to share with you guys as well so she said I only use K products look forward to listening to your podcasts as I always learn something about skincare and new products. In America, most over-the-counter skin routines include cleanser, toner, and moisturizer with or without SPF. There might be an eye cream and a night moisturizer to add in. So that's three to five average steps, and those are placed on the shelf together to make a product kit. Uh, so she said there isn't a specific teen skincare package, and so they actually enjoy the teen skincare segment. Um, I, I have my teenager listen to it and we were very excited to order soon. I have learned with K-Beauty, it's about selecting the products that are best for your skin's needs rather than the one with the least or most skincare steps. Keep up the great work. So thank you very much to Lorraine for sending that through. Really appreciate uh, your feedback as well. And I'm really happy that you are enjoying the show. Now, for this week's recommendation of the week, I'm not sure whether I would call this a recommendation or an anti-recommendation, but anyway, I have been watching the latest season of Bling Empire on Netflix, and I just honestly don't know how I feel about this show. I was enjoying it for the first couple of seasons because I was like, oh, look, it's just kind of, you know, lighthearted. But as it gets further in, I mean, obviously it just, this season in particular, I feel like it's just like really scripted up the wazoo. Like there's just, I don't know, without spoiling anything, like people are inviting other people to things that I'm just like, nobody would ever do that. Like you would not 
do that like obviously the producers have put you up to this so I get it like I know that reality TV is not like you know spontaneous or natural and that they've got camera crews following them around I think my bigger issue with this program as it goes on is just that on the one hand you know I heard a lot of people saying that they're, they're really happy that there is a show like this because they can you know it's it's more representative and diverse because they've got a whole Asian cast on TV and I do understand that but I think my problem is that I don't think this show is doing any favors for the Asian community. I think it's inherently problematic to, you know, have a show that features everyone. Like, let's face it, a lot of these characters are very vapid. They seem to care a lot about how they look. There's a whole lot of everyone's using plastic surgery and people are getting their, you know, lips filled and things like that on the show. Very much about appearance, about the clothes they're wearing, about, you know, the cosmetic surgery and about money and, you know, the the fact that everyone's rich. And I just don't think that that is a great narrative to put out there for the Asian community anyway, Uh, particularly because, you know, I get the whole crazy rich Asians trope and people love that, but there are a whole lot of Asians in every community, including in the communities that they're trying to represent, that are not crazy rich people. They're just hardworking, honest people running the local, uh, you know, dry cleaners or a local restaurant or something like that. And I feel like if it was actually trying to be diverse or representative, like there'd be there'd be normal everyday people on the show rather than these people. So I think that's my bigger problem with it. I'm just like, this isn't really very diverse, subversive. This isn't really promoting Asianness and Asian culture in the way that they think they are. I just yeah, and I'm just finding the storylines and plots as it goes on is just really <laughs> wild and out there, which I watch some pretty crazy reality TV. Like, I have a very low bar. Like, I love The Real Housewives. Like, that's my kind of jam. But you know what you're getting in for. You know you're getting in for people that are just doing absolutely outlandish, crazy, ridiculous things. And, you know, uh, I don't know. There's just something about this show that just falls a little bit flat for me. Um <sighs> Yeah, and I think watching the representations of it is one of them that I'm just like, ah, I don't know. Like, I definitely think we need a lot more diversity. We need shows showcasing, you know, more people. But I don't know if that is the English language version that we need. I feel like maybe, maybe some of the Korean ones, uh, you know, that are just subtitled into English are better viewing? I I don't know. I don't know whether that's a recommendation or an anti-recommendation. I'm still watching along for what it's worth. So you'll have to let me know. I did a poll on my stories the other day and the results were very, very mixed, whether people love it, hate it, or love to hate it. Uh, so uh, I don't know. The, this season in particular, I'm just like, I'm not sure whether I should keep watching this. But let me know. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you love to hate it? You'll have to come and find me if you're not already following me on Instagram. Let me know what you think. I'm feeling conflicted. That is where I'm going to come down on it. I'm just like, I get it. It's humorous. You know, it's poking a bit of fun at people that live crazy lives, but uh, I don't know how I feel about it. (laughs) Anyway, I'm going to wrap up here for today. I hope you have enjoyed today's episode. Uh, If you have, I would appreciate a rating and a review as well feel free to share it with someone that you think would enjoy it. Uh, And I will be back in your ears later on. And in the meantime, I will see you on Style Story. 